Messaging Workshop will feature two speakers. We have Mr. Bill Marcy, a native of uh, Mississippi and a law enforcement veteran. He will be speaking about how to uh, message defending our second amendment right. And as a father of four daughters, definitely the last thing I wanted someone telling me how large of a clip I can use to defend them. And then uh, the second will be on the school choice. Uh, we have Mr. Eric Lewis, the managing partner of Sable International, um, a organization development firm that uh, focuses on a lot of different um, opportunities, or a lot of different um, components of managing organizations, including um, political relations, and he will also feature um, addressing school choice. So first, Mr. Marcy, and then to follow me, Eric Lewis. So how are we doing out there? Right. Are you excited? Yeah. Hey man, listen, this is this is about this is about victory. This is about lining up, learning the plays, so when the game, when the whistle is blown, we know what to do. And we've had some great, great speakers earlier. Um, let me just introduce myself briefly, and they only gave me a few minutes here. Um, my name is Bill Marcy. Um, I'm an American citizen. I'm a, I'm a believer that the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior, and uh, I believe that here in America, we are we are just blessed to be here. You know, we could have been born any place in the planet, and there's some places that is, is tough, but you know something? It doesn't get any better than being born in the United States. And if you don't believe it, you need to get, get on a plane and, and go some of the places I've gone, and you'll find out when you get back home, you want to sit down and, and kiss that ground. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, 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 the bishop for, for lining this up and uh, my good friends uh, from all over the conservative world we've had here, uh, Dr. Tim and, and Star Parker. We've met, uh, we met in, in Washington and, and in other places. But um, what about me, which is probably the least most important thing we're going to talk about. Bill Marcy is a, is a guy that was born in the democratic stronghold of the city of Chicago. Where I was born, there was no such thing as a Republican. I ended up having a variety of jobs. I started off as a, as a chemist, uh, decided that was a little too boring, went into law enforcement, spent, spent 10 years uh, in the high crime areas of Chicago, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and uh, eventually went into business and uh, retired uh, vice president of uh, Westinghouse Electric Security Systems um, and had responsible to our offices of about 40 states. Uh, I came into the political arena just recently. Uh, in 08, uh, I'm sitting there, nice and retired, with a cold in my hand. Me and Glenn Beck were talking on the radio, talking on TV. I'm talking to him through the TV, and my wife says, Bill, you need to run for election. And there was an election coming up. There was a statewide, no, there was a, a congressional district, the third congressional district, and, and I figured, well, I've nothing else to do, so I, I decided to jump into that. Found out that there are very few black conservatives in the state of Mississippi. But somewhere along the line, I was welcomed into the Republican Party and ended up doing pretty well. Got to know the governor, um, Governor Haley at the time, uh, asked me what I would consider moving into the second district, I was running in the third, and uh, because there is a progressive, and when I use the word progressive, I, I mean, there, there's three or four words that can go along with them. Communist, socialist, liberal, progressive. What other words do you want to use? That's what, had, who had been in office for over 20 years. And the district that, that I was going to be running for was the, the Delta. And if any of you guys know anything about Mississippi's Delta, Mississippi's Delta is probably the poorest area in the nation. Even though we have the most valuable land and farmland in those cities of Indianola, Clarksdale, Greenwood, um, Greenville, um, up the road, you will find some of the poorest areas. And I thought that after God had blessed me to, 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 to with the life he gave me, I wanted to make sure our children had that same opportunity. 
but um, you know, it's hard fighting, as Star was talking, it's hard fighting a battle that has gone on for years. For over 50 years, uh, the progressives have brainwashed people to believe something that's not true. They've been brainwashed to believe that our Republicans uh, are our enemies. You know, uh, the, uh, actually, uh, the seat I, were, I was ran for twice was a seat um, held originally by John Roy Lynch. And as Dr. Tim said, if you don't know who John Roy Lynch is, don't call yourself a Republican. For the rest of us who, who probably don't know, John Roy Lynch was a black man from Natchez, who actually he was born and raised in Louisiana, at the end of the Civil War, and uh, as a slave, uh, he ended up becoming um, the Speaker of the Mississippi House of Representatives by, 19, by 1868 and 69. Eventually became the first United States black man who was a United States Congressman, John Roy Lynch. You need to look him up. There's another guy that you need to know, Hiram Rebels. Hiram Rebels was the first black United States Senator ever happens to be from the state of Mississippi. And on that note, I just want to make an announcement, and, 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 and Bishop, I, I want to share this here with your group, that I will be running for the United States Senate here, here. at the seat where Hiram Rebels once sat. Here, here. Okay. But back to what we're here for. We're here to talk about the, the Second Amendment. Now, we, you, you, we all understand that the Constitution it is a document that, that, as Fred Frederick Douglass said, when he first when he first was told about the document, he said he didn't want to know anything about the Constitution because the Constitution was, was had embroiled slavery. But after he read the Constitution, he said the Constitution is the is the, the greatest document of freedom that has ever been happened. In that Constitution, there are lots of things that the government cannot do to people. We limited the size of government. But before the founders, after a long battle with, with Britain, decided to, to ratify that constitution, they said, we want to make sure that the government understands they can't do certain things to people. And they, 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 before they would ratify it, they, they gave 10 amendments all at one time. And we know the First Amendment was speech and freedom of religion and freedom of the press, and the, which we see where I'm in trouble with right now. But you know what the Second Amendment was? The right to bear arms. Now, as a former law enforcement officer in Chicago, I didn't know any better. I thought people were not allowed to have guns. And if you know anything about the city of Chicago now, it's probably the most dangerous place on the planet. You would probably be better off, better served if you were in Baghdad or in Afghanistan. Uh, the Second Amendment says, real briefly, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the rights of the people to keep and bear arms shall not, shall not be infringed. We were afraid that, that we were going to create a King George. But we're also saying that a man has a right to protect his, his home. But you know something? Those progressives have told us that you do not have a right to protect your home. You do not have a right to protect your family. And to give you an idea, um, Chicago, two days ago, happens to be the night uh, our president, who was from Chicago, which he, that's where he calls home, um, was in town. This is Chicago. A 56-year-old woman who was found on the South, South, South Shore neighborhood with a single gunshot wound was among the four people killed in the violence in a 12-hour span that left 11 more injured in the shooting Wednesday night. Police out on routine patrol heard gunshots where an unidentified woman's body was found and discovered her lying on the sidewalk on East 79th Street. At 11.45, gunshots, they, they heard gunshots and they found her with a bullet hole in her head. A woman was, another woman was taken in critical condition to an area hospital but later died on Thursday. Witnesses told police the woman did not appear to be the intended target. The shootings got off 
The shootings got off to an early start when the first victim killed around at 1 p.m. that a 25-year-old man was shot in the neck and the side at 122nd in Halston in the city of West Pullman neighborhood, was taken to an area hospital and pronounced dead, according to the Tribune. Police believe the shooting was gang related. Roughly an hour later, 34 year old Michael Kayser was fatally shot in the Roseland by, by two men in the 100, 100 block of 107th Street. The, the, the Tribune reported Kayser was pronounced dead in about a, an hour after the, the, the preceding shooting. Just before 7 p.m., a 36-year-old man was fairly shot in the 7500 block of South Carpenter Street, where apparently sitting, was apparently sitting in a lawn chair drinking a beer. The Sun Times reported he believed that some, someone walked up to the man whose name was being held pending family notification, and he, they shot him twice in the head. Eleven more people were injured in shootings on South Side the same day President Obama returned to his hometown to raise money for congressional Democrats. These neighborhoods I just talked about, every one of them was in an area that I policed. I know this area well. We have abused the Second Amendment so that people are unable to protect their homes. In the city of Chicago, they have abuse the Second Amendment more than any other place in the nation, probably with the exception of Washington, D.C. If you do not have the right to defend your family, what do you do? Unfortunately, the Democrats have convinced black folks, let's call them like it is, that for some reason they're too irritable. Back in 1964, I was graduating from high school, and I just got to give my age. Oh, yeah. I'm an old guy. Yeah. I know I look young, but I love that. I remember um, a, a Time magazine. They had an article, because you know the Klan was doing their thing, and everybody was, was scared. There was a group of men here in Louisiana, in a place called Jonesboro, Louisiana. Anybody know that place? Oh, yeah. Okay, Jonesboro. In Jonesboro, a group of African American men led by Ernest, quote, Chili Willie Thomas, and listen to this, Frederick Doug Douglass Kilpatrick formed the group known as the Deacons of Defense and Justice to protect members of the uh, of court, Congress for Racial Equality against the Ku Klux Klan. Most of the deacons were veterans of World War II and the Korean War. What they did is basically said, no more are we going to run. If you decide to burn a cross, this was in Time Magazine, I remember, I was 18 years old. If you decide to burn a cross in, in my neighborhood, understand the rules have changed. No longer will you walk into my front yard and, and, and dig a hole and plant a cross and, draw, and have a big circle of guys and sing Kumaya. That ain't happening. <laughs> But we're inside the house with guns. <laughs> and we're going to let you know that we have a right to protect ourselves. Right here in Louisiana. That's where it started. And the Klan didn't change that much, but they did change the procedure a little bit. Instead of driving up, taking their time to dig, dig that hole, put that cross in, they decided to put in a port, bring in a portable cross, one about two and a half feet tall, that they could shove out of the window as they drove back. As they sat it down <laughs> quickly in their front yard, where another car came along with a torch at 30 miles an hour. <laughs> That's what guns are for. The Second Amendment is not about hunting and fishing, and all the rest of that stuff. The, the Second Amendment is about protecting us from those, those inalienable rights that God has given us. So, what we need to do is go back into the community. And I know Louisiana has good laws, like the, like the state of Mississippi, uh, uh, where somebody was, we were talking about, uh, talking to the senator over here, and, and, and we have the castle law. The castle law in Mississippi says, if you're in your house, and someone is invading your house, you don't have to wait till they get in. 
drop them on the porch. <laughs> no longer do you have to drag that body across the pressure. <laughs> That person has violated your castle, and it prohibits our district attorneys from prosecuting you. In other words, it doesn't say they will prosecute you after you spend $100,000 on defense. It prohibits the, the state's attorney or the district attorney from prosecuting you because we have inalienable rights to protect our families. But if when you take away those rights, you take away man, the, a man's ability to stand up and be a man. Give me an example. In my, 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 my hometown of Chicago, there was, when I was in law enforcement, we had, I had two guys I was working with, we were working undercover, plain clothes, you know where you want to go. And these guys were kind of trying to set a record for arresting the people, for locking up folks. And, and, and they would go out and as a businessman close his store on these same streets that I just ran out. They, and he, as he's walking out of the store with a little bag of money in his pocket and a gun in the other, they will call him over to the car and say, do you have your pistol with you? And of course, he's being good, honest, law-abiding citizens. Of course, officer, of course I do. So well, you know you're not supposed to get in the car. After a hundred of these arrests, they finally marched on the station to talk to our commander to find out why are you doing this. And he had to explain to him, in the city of Chicago, you are not allowed to possess a gun. Not on the street, not in your house, not in your vehicle, not a long gun, not a short gun, not a squirt gun. You cannot have a gun. And because of that, the criminals have decided to vanquish the neighborhood to a point where people are afraid. Businesses left the town. And now all we have are drug dealers and drug pushers. And the gangs right now, this is a quote just out of the same article, there are 100,000 gang members in the city of Chicago alone. Now I can take this story to Los Angeles, to Newark, to San Francisco, to Atlanta, not too far from here to New Orleans, and I can tell you the same story over and over again. Our people are hurting. But God does not expect them to hurt without being able to defend yourself. So what we need to do is make sure when we are talking to folks in, in our communities that the Second Amendment is important to them because they're dying in the streets as we speak. See, if you have a gun in your home, the guy's going to think twice about coming into your house. If somebody is out there threatening your wife and she's getting out of the car in your driveway, you might have something to say about that. And you must have an ability to back up. Because she, when I'm talking to the, to the men, we have a responsibility to take care of the women and the children in our life, right? Here, here. And when they take our ability, take our Second Amendment from us, okay, then people die. What I just want to share with you is the, the, the message that, that we must continue to always fight. But you know, Chicago is no different than anybody else. In Chicago, the mayor, Rob Emanuel, former chief of staff for President of the United States, has a bodyguard group. I used to know of quite a few guys who worked in the mayor's bodyguard. There are over 50 full-time police officers that are with him and his family all the time. But they tell you or me or that we are not allowed to protect our families. So now when you start seeing what's happening, you understand people have no ability to protect themselves. Republicans are not pushing this point in our inner cities. In our inner cities, we have to tell the, these young punks that no longer do you own the street. No longer will you walk into my home. Like we told the Klan in 1964, we need to tell who, and I don't care if you're blue, white, purple, green, polka dots. 
come up in my driveway acting crazy, you might be left there acting crazy. This is rough, it's rough talk, but when people are dying, I just read it to you, four people killed in 12 hours on the night of presidents in town. And it happens every night. We must push the second. When they're talking about, we don't want kids, uh, uh, guns in our schools. You know, this uh, Sandy Hook, uh, come on. Here's a teacher, a, a young woman who, who, who was, she said she's about 4'11". She, her principal in the school, she threw her body in front of an armed man. But he was still able to kill 26 years. Suppose we had, suppose she had a gun. Suppose she had an armed police officer in that school. Those children would still be alive. Maybe she would be alive. I know in the South we don't have to sell this message as much. But when you hear it on TV, you hear it in the cities of New York, the mayor talking about we must have gun control. Remember, where the last time there was massive gun control was in Nazi Germany and Stalin Russia. And the people who suffered the most were the minorities. You say that again. They take our guns from you. The minority always suffers. We have to understand this. So when you hear people talking about gun control, they're not talking about protecting their gun. The mayor of Chicago is not talking about getting rid of the 50 well-armed uh, law enforcement that, that surround him and his family. He's talking about taking it your gun, your ability to protect your family and your community. I just want to share this message of the Second Amendment. We are missing the boat in the Republican Party. There are more deaths in, this, in, 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 in the, the inner cities of this nation than almost any place in the world. It is so bad in most of these cities, it's not newsworthy. Because it happens all the time. When I was in law enforcement, you know, we'd have all these shootings and stuff. And the rule is, unless you were killed in the downtown section of, of State and Madison, where the, the busiest two streets in the city, unless you got killed under the Marshall Fields clock at 12 o'clock noon, your name would not appear in the newspaper and definitely wouldn't be on TV. Your death was just accepted. No longer can we do this. No longer can we stand up. We are good, law-abiding citizens that have control of ourselves. We don't go out there and kill people willy-nilly. But we will protect our families. So I share this with you, and I share this message with you, and I want you guys to understand, I know where you are. I have run three races. Now, as my, my good friend Tim, uh, Tim said, Dr. Tim said, you got to keep running. Keep running. If you run one time and get whooped, lick that wound and get right back up. You know? Because the first time you run, nobody knows you. The second time, they say he's back again. The third time, what do they say? He's right. You must be crazy. <laughs> they know your name. My wife keeps telling me, she says, Bill, you know, I remember I was retired. She, she, she says, Bill, you know, you are the most well-known black conservative in the state of Mississippi. I don't want to be the most well-known black conservative in the state of Mississippi. I want to be the most well-known conservative in the state of Mississippi. And God bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. All right, so we, we're going to have to be a little bit more interactive while I'm going to stand up here talking because y'all were too quiet while that brother was up here talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, just real quick. So again, my name is Eric Lewis. As uh, Charles said, I'm a managing partner with Sable International. Um, we're a management consultant firm. Uh, we provide consulting services in the areas of business development, uh, governmental affairs, and political consulting, uh, work, workforce development, and public relations. And so my task is to talk to you about school choice. Um, and so I, before I do that, I, I guess I want to share a couple things. Um, and I do want to acknowledge a, a couple really good friends of mine uh, who have been on the battlefield. I don't, I don't know if Leslie, I can't see Leslie right now, but school board member Leslie Ellison from New Orleans, um, 
Ms. Barbara Thomas, who ran for District 63 here in Baton Rouge, and then Mr. Harold Williams, who ran in District um, 101. 101 here in Baton Rouge. Uh, and then Mr. Ralph Washington, who is holding up the, the banner out there with us in Central. Uh, so I want y'all to give them a round of applause. Uh, and so here, here's the deal. Uh, when we talk about school choice, that is essentially um, giving parents the right to choose the best educational and learning environment for their child. And so for the last couple of years, been involved in some of that work here in Louisiana. Um, and so I just want to go share a couple of stories with you real quick. You know, I, I grew up, I graduated from high school in 1991. Uh, I graduated from Glen Oaks High School, which I believe, uh, and I'm sure Mr. Steve Atkins, one of my mentors, believes, is you know, it's one of the greatest high schools in this state. You know, and, and so I tell free people frequently, as much as I love Glen Oaks High School, I mean, even throughout college, I had a panther on my wall. Love that school dealer. But today, I would not send my kids to that school. And so here's the reality. Um, last year, and it's ironic that we're having this meeting today because right now at the state capitol, uh, there's a huge budget fight that's going on. Um, and school choice is caught in the middle of that budget fight. And so this time last year, Governor Jindal launched out on this plan uh, to create more options for children. And at the time, of the 700,000 public school students in Louisiana, 66% um, of our schools were labeled as failing schools. And what that means is that of those 66% of those schools, uh, there was a large percentage of the kids in those schools that were not grading on level. Now most of us in this room know that the majority of those schools that are labeled as failing schools are in what communities? Come on, y'all got to be interactive. Black right communities. Now. Black communities. Black community. Okay. And so those that are not in black communities are highly populated with what kind of children? White. Black children. If they're not in black communities and they're failing, they're highly populated. Those of you from Louisiana know that we don't have a whole lot of white kids going to public schools, especially in large urban districts like Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Lafayette, and Shreveport. And so that being said, what color are the elected officials that are representing the parents of these black kids? They're black. They're black. They're black. They're black. They're black. Don't be scared. <laughs> They're black. Now, if y'all don't start talking up, I'm going to ask the white people to leave the room. <laughs> I'm going to ask the white people to leave the room. Okay. So, okay. So, here's the issue we have a governor who um, obviously he's not black, and he's not white. But he stepped out and he pushed this issue. And last year at the Capitol, you know, the unions were crying because things weren't fair, and I felt sorry for him, you know, because the governor had things in his control. I mean, the dude was moving. And we had nine black legislators that voted one way or the other for some type of education reform. Only nine. All right? And so some of them understood, you know, some of them, they found the Lord, but they also had a child who would be entering schools in these same communities pretty soon. And so they felt like their child deserved better. Um, some of them genuinely believed in school choice. Okay, but there was only nine. And I want to say we have about 27 black legislators in the legislature. At least 27, it may be more than that. All right, and so let, let's hear some of the arguments that we have from folks. Um, and for those of you who know me, I'm going to call out names. Because some of y'all are represented by these folks. Some of y'all go to church with these folks. Some of y'all even ran against these folks. And black people voted for them instead of voting for you. All right? So let's just talk about the voucher program itself. I already talked about public schools in general, but let's talk about the voucher program. So we have, this past school year, 4,747, 4, I believe, kids that were on the voucher program. We have nearly 8,000 kids that have been awarded vouchers for next school year. 90% um, of the kids that are on the voucher program are what color? Take a guess. Black. They're black. Okay. So, last year, as we were going through this battle, um, we had black people. Some people, work for the, some people work for the union 
had a black man work for the teachers union, made a comment that poor people don't have the aptitude to decide what's best for their kids. This was a black man that made this statement. <laughs> so poor him, Governor Jindal used some black parents and had lunch with them and blasted him. And then a couple a black organization blasted him. But that was wrong. Because we shouldn't have blasted this black man for saying that poor people, and the majority of them are black, don't have the aptitude to decide what's best for their kids. So then last year, we also had a situation at that same luncheon where media was there, and it was covered by the advocate, where a young lady said that her child uh, attends a public school in Baton Rouge, and he has an IEP, and the school has never serviced him. Never serviced him. Two days later, I get a phone call from the then chairwoman, my good friend, Ms. Patricia Haynes-Smith, accusing this lady of lying. Now, from those of you from Baton Rouge, y'all can probably figure out how she assumed this woman was lying because she was the former president of the school board. Okay, and the school that the child attended was not listed in the paper, but some way, Ms. Pat was able to get in touch with the principal of the school. And I'm not gonna put her on blast because she's my friend. <laughs> but, ironically, the parent got a call from the principal that next day now, the principal wasn't bashing the parent. She was apologizing and wanted to get it taken care of. And so that's how serious people that are representing our people are about protecting the status quo. East Baton Rouge Parish has the largest school district in this state post Hurricane Katrina. Um, and, you know, had probably had one of the most prolific DSA cases in this state. I recall when my brother was growing up, uh, he went to Capitol Elementary. As a result of DSA, they closed that school. The elementary school he and I then went to when I was in kindergarten, that got closed as a result of DSA. When we moved, because my parents were able for us to move, when we moved, the majority of white school that we were going to, Sharon Hills Elementary, two years later, the district closed a school in Zion City, which is a neighborhood over. And we're busting up, you know, well, all black kids have to come over there. All right. And so at some point, you know, we can talk about racism and we can talk about how the white people have left the city. But how many of y'all understand that right now black people are in complete control of the East Baton Rouge Parish School District? We have our third black superintendent. Um, and even though we're a slight, slight minority on the board, if you look at most of the administration, we're controlling the school district. But yet, the biggest proponent, or the biggest op one of the biggest oppositions from school for school choice, is this very same school district that's educating our kids. Eighty-five to ninety percent of the kids in that school district are black. All right, so the unions are crying because we're taking their kids. These kids belongs to the te belong to the teachers union. Uh, there's a DSA case in Tangible Hope Parish where the, the DSA, the judge, the federal judge, tried to block the voucher program uh, because those kids being in the voucher program prevented Tangible Hope Parish School District from building new schools. Anybody want to take a guess how many kids left the school district in Tangible Hope Parish to participate in the voucher program? Just take a guess. Zero? 50 kids were prevent, preventing them from building new schools, they claim. 50 kids. And so I'm going to go back to the brother's comments about people dying on the streets. I had a young lady at my church who graduated and had a diploma that had the Louisiana seal on it. And I love this state. So for Black History Month, she was doing a, per, a, pro, a report and my son was doing a report. And at the time, my son was in the second grade. No, the third grade, I'm sorry, he was in the third grade. And this young lady who graduated is out of high school, could barely read her report. And my, my third grader did better than her on her report. And so it, it, it troubles me when we have black people, black people defending a system that if, even if you want to go back to DC, that has not educated our kids. 
when we have people graduating, kids graduating out of the system and going to college and are flunking out of college because they're not prepared. And I see it every single day. They are not prepared. Now, now white folks, if y'all want to leave the room, that's fine. <laughs> because here's the other side of it. Some of us have become so affluent, you know, because we used to go to Mama House for Sunday dinner in Eaton Park, in the bottom of the bird station. But now we didn't move to the south side of town, we didn't move to Zachary, we didn't move to Central like I have. And we got our cousins and kin folks, maybe our brothers and sisters' kids, that's still in the same fight. Some of us can call the school board office and get our kids into those magnet programs or some of those other schools that other folks can't get into. And then we will sit and say that I paid for my child to go to private school. Why they can't pay for their child to go to private school? I was at a barbershop this morning at Webb's Barbershop that everybody used to go to back in the day. And I'm looking at black kids with you high shirts on, Episcopal, that's like $18,000, is that right? All right, so, and when Steve and I were in school, you know, we had kids that should have been going to Glen Oaks. But some way, miraculously, they were able to go to Catholic High and Episcopal and all these other schools. And I know good and well their parents couldn't afford for them to go there. But they could run a ball or they could shoot a ball. All right? And so black folks sat by idly while young black men were able to make a name for themselves at some of these same private schools because they could run and they could shoot. And I'm not hating on them even though they would beat me and Steve in football, you know. I'm not hating on them. But black folks said by Ivy, while some of these same kids went to these same schools because they could run a rock. But then when little JoJo and little baby want to go to get education, some of these same black folks, I'm telling you, don't want them kids sitting next to their kids at these same schools. All right, and so as I told my friend Mika, I hit a, I'm here to chastise us as black people. Because when we were running these campaigns and people talked about being conservative, how many of y'all grew up in church? See, y'all allowed white folks to take that word conservative and run with it. How many of y'all grew up, I'm talking just black people, white people just be quiet for a minute. How many of y'all grew up in church? With the same preacher that the Democrats and got hoodwinked? will sit up and rebuke homosexuality and all this other stuff. And we sit and allow white folks to take the label of conservative. Talk, man. Amen. Allow them to take it from us. Talk, man. Thank you, baby. Thank you for that. Because I'm sitting right here, and I'm listening to Rush Limbaugh, and I'm listening to all these folks. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's the same thing we talk about in my church. All the time. That's right. Well, we ain't got no Republicans in my church. <laughs> My pastor can't stand Republicans. I'm just going to be honest with you. <laughs> but we can't allow people to take ownership of moral fiber in this country. Very good. All right? Very good. And so when we talk about school choice, it is a moral issue. When we have folks stand up, and, and people say this all the time. I don't remember the guy named from Alabama that stood at the, you know, the door of the schoolhouse and wouldn't let the black kids in the University of Alabama. Wallace, so. But now we George Wallace State. So now we got our people standing in the door of the schoolhouse trying to keep kids in. Well, kids get molested, raped, beat up daily, and not get an education. It's good, man. So let me take it a little bit further home. All right. And so when Miss Barbara and I, because I remember this distinctly. When Ms. Barbara and I were walking on election day to a family, about 10, 15 people, just sitting, chilling on election day, while Republicans had put money on the street for the Democrat that was running against her. All right? Put money on the street for the Democrat that was running against her. Flyers, campaign, street workers. We go to this family to try to get them to come and get in the van and go vote. How many, how many beer bottles were sitting there? Somebody turned the crowd upside down in the bottle. 
and said, I'm not going to vote. And one of the young ladies had been serviced by Ms. Barber's pro-life center. Had been serviced by the child was sitting right there who would not have been there if it wasn't for Ms. Barber. Okay? And so I bring that to you because in that same neighborhood, well, my university, Southern University is housed. Large state, I just had to tell them boys from Jackson State about it. Um, right there on the back of Southern University campus, where we were educated black minds. Ton of large black churches in that community. In that very same community, we got a family school right down the street. And we got a public school district in that same community that shut down the school this school year. And next year, it's going to open that same school back up. And they only close it to prevent the state from taking it over. They're going to open that same school back up because they need somewhere to house middle school students. And these are black people that are voting to play these games with our kids. Two weeks, maybe a month prior to this, two schools in the same neighborhood. All right. And so these are the arguments that Harold and Ms. Barber were using you know, to help people understand school choice from a political standpoint. Two schools, and this happens in multiple places around this city. One school's an F school, another school's a C school. Now the first thing I need to figure out is why kids from the same neighborhood are doing different at two schools that right down the street from. So what does the school district do to prevent the state from taking the school? They're gonna bring <coughs> kids from the C school to the F school to help bring the scores up. And what do the parents at the C school say? The same thing as the parents at the elite private school say, I don't want my kids being educated with them kids. And it's the same neighborhood. So here's the reality. Now for me, for me personally, I advocate for school choice because I know that some certain times poor people can't pick up and move. They don't have the money to pay to go to private school. And they don't have the access to call the school board president and say, I need to get my school into this mag my child into this magnet school. And so that, that's where I'm coming from. Because poor people are the ones that continue to be left out. And black politicians claim to advocate for poor people or the term is the least of these. Okay? And so my challenge to you as black conservatives is we have to stop sitting out of the by while our own people are killing our own kids. Bravo. Bravo. Two weeks ago, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Bravo. Two weeks ago, and I'll close with this, because uh, this is probably my favorite one. <laughs> Two weeks ago, uh, we held a rally at the state capitol. Had over a thousand kids and parents rallying on behalf of school choice. Some of y'all may have been there. And again, 90% of the kids that were out there in the sea of kids looked just like me. No, they weren't ugly. They were black. Okay? 90% of them. Had a young black man who was nervous because he was going to be speaking with the governor. And so he got to speak to a thousand kids in front of the governor. That was like the joy, I mean, that was like the basic, biggest experience for him. All right, so these kids, they came from New Orleans, they came from Lafayette, they came from Baton Rouge to remind legislators that they promised to give them access to a better education. Great event. News coverage all across the state. The next day, Senator Yvonne Dorsey. How many of you are from Baton Rouge? I don't know, because I'm going to defend you if this should give him. So, you know, Senator Dorsey's tagline in her commercials, y'all know me. I'm your girl Yvonne from Easy Town. Okay, so she grew up poor. Senator Yvonne Dorsey got on the floor of the Senate and chastised us because last year we criticized teachers for taking the day off to come protest education reform. Now, mind you, I'm sorry, it's a couple of days before standardized testing. My bad. So she found it hypocritical that those same people would bring kids to the state capitol to lobby for things and they didn't even know what they were lobbying for. Again, our kids are too stupid to know what they need. They're too stupid to understand that the school area works for them. 
and that they utilize these kids like cattle. Okay? And so, um, here's my concern. I know, and everybody in this room that's from Baton Rouge knows, that black people have a great deal of respect for Senator Yvonne Dorsey. Black people have a great deal of respect. I'm going to give a shout out to the New Orleans people. Black people have a great deal of respect for Senator Karen Carter Peters. They have a tremendous amount of respect for Representative Patricia Haynes Smith. And I'm there with them. But when we have things that impact black people and we have black people fighting, then we need black people standing up. Because I'll tell everybody, as I've said before, I never said Bob Jenner was my friend. But what I don't need is Bobby Jindal coming to defense of black people when we got black people standing around being quiet. Here, here. So my charge to you today is to come out of the closet. Probably shouldn't use that one. <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> <laughs> they got the bond you for that Tuskegee removing the veil of ignorance. We have got to stop hiding, all right? Because when I came back to Van Rouge and I had a meeting with Ralph McCollis, I don't know, we were talking about a black chamber or something, I don't know. But I told him, this is before I met Harold, I told him that what I'm not trying to do is I'm not trying to become the next Cleo Fee. And Ralph told me, why not? He speaks for all y'all. No, the hell he don't. <laughs> Okay, so is that, that's what I need, Harold, and Margaret, and Leslie, and Ralph, to make sure everybody in Baton Rouge and Louisiana understand. One black person and 10 black people don't speak for every black person. That's right. And we all need to start speaking up for the issues that are important to us, because what black, white people don't know is when we in church on Sunday, we talk about the same issues. <laughs> All right, so y'all need to come on out the closet and stop letting people kill our people. Thank you. Um, this workshop ended a little bit early um, before we break. Does anybody want to ask Eric or Bill Marcy any questions? Because we do have Let's a few Let's bring them back to the stage. Let's bring both of them back to the stage. Give the people a vote on a separate 
additional breakaway school system. Because an F is an F. We're failing now. What's the worst we can do? Fail? We're there. So please help us with our school system. Thank you so much. So let me add to that real quick. And I, I neglected, which I should have done. There, there's also, because um, I, I alluded to the fight that's going on. And, um, and so even like for the voucher program right now, because of the lawsuit that came down, um, schools haven't gotten paid the last quarter uh, for this school year. And then obviously um, we have to push to find additional funding for next school year. So right now that official additional funding has been placed in the state budget and it's going to be debated on the Senate floor on Saturday. And I can promise you some of those senators that I named are going to be fighting to take that money out. And so as she said, um, we also need you to call legislators and implore them to support continued funding for the state scholarship program. Um, one of the things that I observed is that I mentioned Senator Dorsey, and so, you know, we don't we, 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 we don't engage our legislators until this time for them to come to church and ask for our vote. We don't engage them until it's that time. And so we were at the Capitol this week talking to senators and representatives about sustained funding for the scholarship program. And I'm sure Senator Dorsey didn't expect parents with their kids that she referred to as cattle to come and lobby her. But that, that's one of the things that we do not do. And, and so again, as we were out on the campaign trail, I mean, people didn't even know who their senators and representatives were. Um, and I, I'm just talking about black folks right now. And so that would be a huge help if you would pick up the phone today. Uh, because on Saturday, the Senate's going to be debating the House bill on Sunday. <laughs> Their house is going to be debating whether or not to pay money that state owes to private schools that they owe them from last school year. Yes, sir. Uh, Eric, uh, you mentioned the, the high esteem that uh, black folks have for uh, Karen uh, Carter Peterson. Now, on yesterday, there was a very inflammatory, in some uh, minds, that she made about Obamacare and that being racist if you felt that it was something that was wrong. How are we, or, or, or how do we approach, how do we change that narrative coming from elected black officials uh, when they take policy stances on issues that affect our community negatively? What is your suggestion? What is your suggestion on that? And then I have a question for you as well, Bill. Well, and I'll just, because um, Leslie knows it. Because Peterson, she come after you. <laughs> so, um, and so I think that's well, first, first and foremost, what, what we have to understand, and, and I think white people have a hard time understanding this. Um, Senator Peterson is a very, very, very smart individual. Oh yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you know, so we can talk about you know different folks, but Senator Peterson is a very smart individual. No doubt. First and foremost, so that just regardless of what color she is, all right. Now, beyond that, if we look at our, our elected representatives, you know, more broadly within the black community, what people have to remember and understand, uh, Joe Delpit, was it Mr. Morreale, and uh, Dick Turner, who just passed away, were some of the first black legislators in this state. And if you go to that state capitol and you look at the, on the wall, I mean, it, it looks like we are coming from a third world country because you don't see black folks until you get to the 70s and 80s. And so there is a close connection between black people and their elected officials, because they are their heroes. Um, and that, that's just how things roll in Louisiana. They, they are their heroes, okay? And so, so where we're at now, um, you know, because I'm not one that believes that you know, we're in a post-racial society, so I just want to be clear about that. But where we are now, um, that's where a lot of the control is. Okay, and so when we're running against these folks and we're going into communities like I was sharing with you with Ms. Barber, um, you know, we had an issue at the poll where this dude was like, this older man was like, I ain't voting for no Republican, I ain't voting for no Republican. Um, and he was about to vote for Ms. Barber. I ain't gonna, and so the lady pointed out she has an R by her name. I can't vote for the Republican. Well, I said, sir, do you notice that for governor and lieutenant governor and secretary of state, you only have an R? <laughs> well, then I just not going to vote for them. 
And so what the, the, the issue that we have is that people are so accustomed to one side of the aisle because of the way history has unfolded in this state, and I'm just going to talk about my state, that a lot of people don't even understand the issues. So you can't get past the label next to your name to actually get to the issues. And so my thing is that as you're campaigning, um, and that, that's what you know, Harold and his Barbara we worked on, what we have to be able to do is reach people where they are. You know, so every black person is not broke, poor, and disgusted. They got jobs. Right. So what's the issue? What, what's the, here's the issue. So here, here's the issue. If I get a paycheck today, and my taxes are 15%, and I got to do, the government is trying to create a program that's going to increase my taxes by 25%, black people understand that. And so we have to, got, we have to stop using political language and talking to people and really reach people exactly where they are. That's why school choice was so big amongst black voters, because they have kids that are dying in these schools. The, the, the Medicaid issue, the, the issue is that, you know, and again, for so long, there have been so many charity hospitals in this state. Some of us probably was born in one of them. And so you can't, you, you have to reach people where they are, understand the connection they have with some of these things that are going on, and when you use derogatory statements to folks that were born in charity hospital in New Orleans, that they take that as you're talking about them. And so I just feel like we have to really kind of understand where the electorate are uh, and convert our language into language that is more a palatable, palatable to them. And Bill, thank you so much, Eric. Bill, <coughs> Eric, Eric brought up a, a, an issue about our, we do look at certain I worked on the Alphonse Jackson campaign when I was growing up, Alphonse being elected from North Louisiana, uh, Shreveport, my home. Heroes fail us sometimes. Absolutely. But our affinity to our skin color continues to drive us toward policies like we, we actually embrace people who are talking about taking away guns. Oh, absolutely. Bill, talk to us about, about how, do we, how do we bring some common sense as the, the deacons of defense mm -hmm. had to bring to their community. How do we bring some common sense to this conversation? Because the emotional conversation about skin color is clouding our judgment. How do we do this? Well, on that very subject, there's, there's no difference between Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. It's the same deal. Here's the problem we have with, with parties. One party takes you for granted, and the other party ignores you. Now, that applies to black folks and white folks. The Democratic Party takes black folks for granted. They say, who else are you going to vote for? You going to vote for that Republican? So I don't have to do anything for you or your children or protect your lives, because I'm the D on the, on the ticket. So, I'm your, I'm, I'm, you're stuck with me. The Republicans, on the other hand, say, why should I waste my time in your area, your community, when I know you're not going to vote for me? I would rather take my money and spend it somewhere where I have a chance of earning some votes. So loyalty to a party is not always good. Sometimes you say, and this is where black folks, who are black folks? Black folks are more loyal to the Democratic Party than the Democratic Party are to the Amen. Party. Amen to that. So like the young brother said, here we are stuck in this situation where they have been for 50 years, 60 years, indoctrinated that Republicans equal with white guy. And the, and, and the Democrat is a black guy, even though it's a white guy. <laughs> Even though it's white guys, I'm saying. Say it again. Say it again. Even though it's a white guys. We have to understand. We have to start talking to folks about this. See, I would rather have. I, I was more loyal to them than they were to me. I'm gonna tell you that again. I was more loyal to them. And what happens is it, it, it gives you a, a kick in the backside, uh, Bishop. And, and, and when you are out there 
pushing that party of uh, uh, Hiram Revels, Blas Kelsey Bruce, uh, 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 Roy Lynch, and they said, Jay Dorf. Uh, okay, and, and, and when, when they ask you, well, well, if that's true, why did they not give you that million dollars that they gave those other three guys of different colors of collection? It's hard to answer that question. And this happens all over the country. You know, where we are is, we, we are fighting, and I'm going to show you, we are fighting a battle with our friends who are not I'm sure they're our friends. They love our vote. No, remember, they love our votes. They will pass you on the head all day long until you decide to run against them. And then they start asking questions. Who are you, really? So what we need to do is understand we cannot be loyal to the Democratic Party and we cannot be loyal to the Republican Party. Remember, we are a minority. We're only 13% of the country. Now, remember, in 1920, before abortion got secure, we were almost 20% of the country. You know, we have allowed that Democratic Party to kill almost half of us. Right. 50 million of us. <laughs> you start asking about Social Security, why is Social Security going broke? Because there's 50 million children that are dead that should be 38, 39 years old. Yeah. So, so they should be paying taxes. Yeah, they, they should be putting into the into the pot. Right. So which the pot's a little low right now because we, we 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 murdered our children. Right. I'm just trying to tell you this that we have to be smarter. As a majority, of, what we do have power is the thumb on the scale. If your thumb was only on one side of the scale, right, Dr. Till? They will look at you and they'll smile in your face. And they'll tell you how great you are. But they won't do nothing for you. But if your thumb can be on either side of the scale, they'll show up at your door, they'll knock and they'll ask for your vote. Bill, you're saying that we should become unpredictable again. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question for Mr. Lewis. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, what do you tell somebody who says, why should my tax dollars go to a school voucher program? Why should my tax dollars go to another kid's education, even though their same tax dollars is probably going to help feed somebody kid when it comes to like entitlement or food stamps, and their child is in that F school and they really don't care. What do you tell them? Like, how how do you say your tax dollars should be invested in some other kids so you can have a better America, a better tomorrow? Okay, so where, where I try to stop that argument at, because you know, people have different philosophies. So right now your tax dollars are educating kids in a public school system. So if you believe it's the government's responsibility, which some people don't, to educate our kids, um, and your tax dollars that are being used to educate kids, it's not educating some kids right now. And so the, the, the issue is, for me, the issue is not that I have an issue with public schools. For me, my issue is that I believe that kids should receive a quality education. No child in this country, and so the gentleman talk, you know, talked about you know, different places around the world, I mean, the reality is that we have kids in this country who are going to get their behinds waxed when they get ready to go to college. Because there are kids from other parts of the world that are killing them. And so we have to ensure that our kids are getting a quality education uh, from K through 12. And right now we're not doing that. Um, and so it doesn't matter if it's in a public school, if it's in a charter school, if it's in a private school, if you want to educate your child at your house. Uh, because the same people that you're talking about, and that, that's one of the arguments that really ticks me off, is that, uh, now, you know, these parents may not say, pay the same amount of taxes that I pay, but they go to the grocery store. Those are tax dollars. And so we're all tax-paying citizens. You know, so unless somebody's homeless, we're all paying taxes here. Um, and so I think, I think the issue that we have is people believe that the government-run school system is the only way that people can be educated. And let's be honest, for black people, and I'm just gonna be clear and honest with you, for black people, that's the way most black people made it into the middle class. And so at the end of the day, it's about protecting people's jobs, their Benzes, their BMWs, the houses in the suburbs that they were able to buy after they got out the hood. And for a lot of folks, that is 
clearly, and all this is about, is protecting their jobs and their livelihoods. Can, can I just add on that real quickly? Yeah. Take your Education is the same problem that we have throughout the country. We have not done an accounting of the dollars. One of the things I think every legislature should do is find out how many dollars that we spend per child and how many end up in the classroom. You find out that there are a lot of dollars that are in the missing category, especially in urban schools. We find that throughout the South, the, the, in parishes or counties, the, the, the county, the, the, the Board of Education, is the greatest employer in the area. In other words, they hire more people than a lot of other places. So when the superintendent or wherever you're charging your school decides to hire people, he's hiring voters. And that voter, is they, that employee is going to get his mama and his daddy and his kids and anybody 18 years old to vote for that superintendent to protect their jobs. So what we have to do is understand real quick math. And I, you know, I was in business. And, and, and one of the things I always wanted to know is where's the dollars? On average, around America, that we spend about $10,000 per child from the, public sector, from the public sector. A classroom of 30 children, real quickly, $300,000. We know we pay the teacher up $40,000, $50,000 if she gets that much, he or she gets that much. We figure the bus got to be thrown in there. The, the classroom is probably, school's already paid for, uh, lights, gas, cleaning, books. Per child, are we, are we up to uh, 300000 150000 Where's the $150,000? The reason our kids are failing is because they're being robbed of the money. Because you've got counselors, you've got consultants, you got people sitting around the, the, the district offices and the, and, and the schools that don't do anything. So let's say, as I've been trying to get our Mississippi legislators to say that by law, 75% of all dollars must be in the classroom, which means that we can give our teachers a raise, we can give each one of our students a laptop or, or, or an iPad, we can put uh, internet, uh, uh, broadband internet throughout all the schools for the same dollars. But we just might have to get rid of some of that dead wood that's sitting around right. soaking up yeah, yeah. the money. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. So just, just a quick comparison. When you look at the state scholarship program, $8,100 on average in this state, $8,100 to $8,500 uh, state and local money, not including federal money, between forty-five to fifty-one hundred. Uh, for students ed educated in the scholarship program. So that, I mean, that just bring $3,000 savings on average per child in the state. Very good. Yeah, yeah, right there. Very good. Yes, yes, sir. I wanted to go back to keeping bare arms for just a second. Yes, sir. Uh, here in Baton Rouge, we have a very liberal Chamber of Commerce. So some of us started a Chamber of Commerce for small business owners. Harold Williams is one of our executive committee members, Ralph Washington, our treasurer. One of our issues is the right to keep and bear arms. Yes. Here in East Baton Rouge Parish, we had 96 murders last year. Our coroner came and spoke to us and said that of those 96 victims, over 85% were black. Yes, sir. It was black on black. Only four of all the 96 victims were armed. Only four were armed. One of the things we started, and I want to urge everybody who has an organization to consider this, we started as a chamber, a firearms training program yes. for the entire community, as many people who want to take it, but we emphasize ladies, because the gun is the great equalizer. Absolutely. It means that the, the lady, even if she's a single lady or lives at home, can defend herself against a big aggressor. That's right. So it's really about helping people who are weaker and, and helping females. And I'll give you an emotional thing that happened at our training the other day. Former Sheriff Greg Ferris was doing a very emotional gun training program. We had a lady come in there. She's probably 50 years old. She was living in fear. But she was more afraid of the gun. So she was holding it there. After she had had an hour of training, she's holding it. 
And when the lady next in the next lane started firing, she started falling back. We had to catch her. <laughs> ten minutes later, ten minutes later, she was standing there in her stance, going boom, 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 right in the heart. She left that training program confident yes. in her ability to defend herself and change her life. Absolutely. But we need to stress training our people. Well, and, 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 you're, and you're right about training our people. But you know, the, the, the big um, unspoken truth in what they're saying is that you are not intelligent enough to own a farm. Like you're not intelligent enough to make a decision on which school you should send your kids to, the F or the A, okay? You're not intelligent enough to possess a firearm and control it properly. I don't believe that. I know that the safest place in the world, when I was a police officer, we used to have a little watering hose where you go get a cold drink every once in a while, and the safest place in our district was that place where all the police officers were sitting around uh, having a cocktail. Because nobody was dumb enough to come in there talking about, I'm, I'm sticking up the place. Firearms and schools, they are, they're talking down to us. But I just want to let you guys know, this is, this is not something someone can take from you. Our Constitution is guarantees it. And when people say, you're not smart enough to own a firearm, children want to go to, that is enough reason to vote that person out. I don't care if they're red, white, blue, or purple. Yeah. Um, Carol. Uh, Y'all have brought up some terrific subjects. Something that, that I want to ask you, if a, a student in one of our schools is attacked, beaten up, molested a lot of effort I think would be made to find out who did that who was responsible and it strikes me that I don't know who is being held responsible when a child is turned loose from these schools with, without an education without the ability to be uh, uh, productive in our society to be what you call dropped out somebody ought to be responsible for that Now, when I got the email about the topics to possibly talk on, um, a good friend of mine's wife, Melissa Harris Perry, talked about kids belonging to the community. Um, and so here's the deal, Harold, because there was a situation in an uh, independent school district here at Baker, I think last year, where two weeks in a row, and I don't know if the teachers just, you know, they lost it, they were burnt out, but they basically cost the kids in the city of Baker. And this is this was the, like during the campaign, um, and so I think as citizens, I mean, whether anybody here is planning on running for office or not, um, that's a public school system where those kids were costed by adults. You know, and so when I talk about kids graduating out of our public school system, not able to read and compute on grade level, not prepared to go into college, I don't even get into this argument of you know everybody's not meant to go to college, but you come out of high school and you can't read, then we have failed you. And so I think as citizens, we all should be up in arms about it. Absolutely. We should be outraged. So whether you live in East Baton Rouge Parish, you live in the city of Baker, you live in the city of Central, you live in, in Shreveport, kids walking across the stage with a diploma on it that has the name of one of your schools on it should tick you off. And so we as citizens should be holding folks accountable. Fire school, I mean fire superintendents, fire school board members, fire elected officials. Because at the end of the day, this cycle is getting ridiculous and it's getting out of hand. And so the biggest part of the problem is we got kids coming out of systems that aren't prepared to be productive citizens, and that's why this brother wants to shoot them. I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's, that's what we have going on. When you got sixth graders, I'm <laughs> but when you got kids that are sixth graders walking the streets every day, because there's a classroom that doesn't keep their interests. Everybody in this room should be pissed off. You know, it's, it's not a matter that I don't have kids because I got a dry cleaners, I got a business that these same kids are gonna stick up at it at night. 
And so when you're watching the news and you're seeing these clowns on the news and some of the ridiculous things that they're coming up with, we all should be outraged by it. You're here. Thank you. I understand the brother Schuler here. I am not advocating us shooting our kids. I do, and I, and I, I have to take some umbrage about the, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a mama and a daddy here. to raise a child. What kept this knucklehead out of trouble wasn't the law or the police, it was mama and daddy. Yes, sir. When, they, when we were on the verge of doing something wrong, I told my friends, now when we get arrested, I want you to understand, I ain't giving my name or phone number. And don't you give my name or phone number. I'm going to stay there because trouble begins when daddy shows up. Because he tells me about how he raised me better than that. And that's how it starts and when we end up. We as a community have to understand that it's not somebody else's problem. It's our problem. It's our problem. If you have a child, supervise that child. You know, I don't know if you want to use corporal punishment on it. They never seem to have a problem. They never asked me about corporal punishment. My teacher, they had a paddle, and my mama, she had a switch. And trust me, between the two of them, I never spent a day in, in captivity. So I'm just trying to tell you, I think we have gone to this, it takes a village to raise a child. No. Take care of your children, and, and, and your children will behave. If your children end up in jail, you did something wrong. Because daddy told me not him or his brothers or any of his cousins ever spent any time, and I wasn't starting to break, I wasn't gonna break that street. Because he would rather, as he said, I'll check, you, I'll check you into this world and I'll check you out. Do you understand me, boy? I said, yes, sir. Very good. We're going to take just one more question and then we're going to take a little break before lunch. Um, so, one more question, Dwayne. This is Eric. It's not a question, it's a comment. The only reason I'm Nene is checked out. And so Nene's kids are a problem. 
And so one of the things that disturbs me is that what we have going on in this state right now, and I'm sure it's happening in other parts of the country, but now we have this local, because it used to be you know state versus federal, now we have this local versus state fight that's going on. And local school districts are playing games to prevent the state from taking over their schools. Yeah. Okay? And so, again, I don't know the situation there, but it wouldn't be you know, beyond belief to have some kids from across the river shipped over to that school to raise those scores. In that very same district, there are two school buildings. There are two school buildings that are two schools, and the scores, and those are magnet schools, and the scores from those two schools are rerouted back to other schools. Okay, and so that is the reason why I say we all need to be outraged, because whether they're our kids or not, uh, our local governments are playing games with our kids, and they're playing games with our tax dollars. Very good, thank you. And so again, I want to charge you all to speak up and to be vocal, and I'm going to share what one of my friends was saying. Don't just come to this convenient and speak. Go to the NAACP. Go to the Urban League. Go to the 100 Black Men. And use these same talking points and those convenings because it's time for us to speak up and speak out.